Um, technology has failed us, so I made a handout instead. Um, but don't read it all at once, because otherwise there are no surprises. We'll give it a bit. I have to go to Waterstones to buy another copy to put on here. <laughs> How many do you have? I think, I think actually that, no, there may be two at home, but one is definitely sort of dog-eared. Um, it's not as okay. Yeah, let's wait, let's wait till about 25 to or something. As you know, Terry, I'm obsessive about timekeeping, but this isn't quite the same. <laughs> Um, so welcome, the few of you that are here. Uh, my name's Tim, Tim Beasley Murray. Um, I teach a variety of things, literature and philosophy. This obviously is slightly different from um, what I normally do. But um, just to explain to you, perhaps you how, how I got to this, perhaps, who here has read the text, by the way? Okay, well, we will read it together. That's absolutely fine. Um, like many parents, I, I ended up reading this for about three months every night in a row. And every evening I come down and I say to my wife, there's some strange things going on here, right? What is this, what is this about? And I realize I'm far from a, a, a alone. Um, but after a while of all these conversations, I thought, well, you know, I'll just write something. And 7,000 words later, I'd written a proper academic article that I published in really the best sort of children's literature journals I was quite pleased with, which is quite interesting if you think that this text is exactly 497 words long. So 7,000 words, I think more like eight actually, seven and a half is quite a lot. But this idea that there's something strange uh, going on in this text, there's something that sort of eludes uh, a, a surface reading, I think is interesting. And subsequently, certainly loads of people, there were all sorts of internet forums where various parents discuss it and so on. This idea that there's, this tiger might not really be a tiger at all. Now, um, Judith Kerr herself, right, radically rejects this. Um, she says, you know, it's just a tiger. And I have a friend who's published by the same publisher as her. And, you know, so she's read this piece and she, she totally, she won't have any, any time for it uh, whatsoever. Um, but she says, you know, I should be able to draw tigers. Here's a quotation on your handout. But I can't. Look at the tiger who came to tea. It's not really a tiger at all. So we're taking that idea seriously and saying what sort of, what might be going on here. And my argument is that basically taking the sort of psychoanalytic approach, particularly informed through psychoanalytic approaches to fairy tales, that we can see the tiger as a sort of uh, projection of different and contradictory uh, sets of unconscious desires. That's really what we're talking about. Um, but the uh, only scholarly article before mine um, that looks at this text takes a rather uh, different approach. This is by a woman who's at the University of uh, uh, Westminster, Louise Sylvester. And she makes quite a convincing argument. Judith Kerr, as you know, was, was born in Germany and she grew up in the 1930s there. Her father was a well-known theatre critic and so on. And the argument is that the knock on the door in the context of Judith Kerr's biographical experiences and one com when co one compares it to when Hit uh, Hitler stole Pink Rabbit, which is a semi-fictionalized autobiographical account. This knock on the door, this dangerous stranger, is as it were the, the, the very real and dangerous knock on the door that Jewish families could expect in the 1930s in Germany. Okay, so this is the sort of standard, well not standard, the, the previous main interpretation. 
um, and that the tiger then re represents the sort of the dangerous stranger who confronts domestic order, right, and brings it into chaos. And as a result, his ransacking of the house, his eating them out of house and home, literally is some sort of displacement of or that corresponds to the Gestapo's brutal house-to-house -house searches, Nazi confiscation of Jewish property, and so on. Now, I don't agree, disagree with her at all. What I'm arguing, once again, in a sort of psychoanalytic vein, is that this text can be over-determined, right? That it can, can represent a number of different things. But first of all, for the one person here and for the rest of you to remind you of the text, um, let's read it just really quickly. It's quite nice if we were doing crime and punishment or something, we wouldn't be able to read it, whereas you can read it here. So here it is, the tiger came to tea, because I'm going to be talking a lot about the pictures, right, which is important. Once there was a little girl called Sophie, and she was having tea with her mummy in the kitchen. Suddenly there was a ring at the door. Sophie's mummy said, I wonder who that can be. It can't be the milkman because he came this morning, and it can't be the boy from the grocer because this isn't the day he comes, and it can't be daddy because he's got his key. We'd better open the door and see. Sophie opened the door, and there was a big, furry, stripy tiger. The tiger said, excuse me, but I'm very hungry. Do you think I could have tea with you? Sophie's mummy said, of course, come in. So the tiger came into the kitchen and sat down at the table. Sophie's mummy said, would you like a sandwich? But the tiger didn't just take one sandwich. He took all the sandwiches on the plate and swallowed them in one big mouthful. And I'm not going to do the noise. And he still looked hungry, so Sophie passed him the buns. But again, the tiger didn't eat just one bun. He ate all the buns on the dish, and then he ate all the biscuits and all the cake until there was nothing left to eat on the table. So Sophie's mummy said, would you like a drink? And the tiger drank all the milk in the milk jug and all the tea in the teapot. And then he looked round the kitchen to see what else he could find. He ate all the supper that was cooking in the saucepans and all the food in the fridge and all the packets and tins in the cupboard. Then he said, thank you for my nice tea. I think I'd better go now. And he went. Sophie's mummy said, I don't know what to do. I've got nothing for daddy's supper. The tiger has eaten it all. And Sophie found she couldn't have her bath because the tiger had drunk all the water in the tap. Just then, Sophie's daddy came home. So Sophie and her mummy told him what had happened and how the tiger had eaten all the food and drunk all the drink. And Sophie's daddy said, I know what we'll do. I've got a very good idea. We'll put on our coats and go to a cafe. So they went out in the dark and all the street lamps were lit and all the cars had their lights on and they walked down the road to a cafe. And they had a lovely supper with sausages and chips and ice cream. In the morning, Sophie and her mummy went shopping and they bought lots more things to eat. And they also bought a very big tin of tiger food in case the tiger should come to tea again. But he never did. Okay, so that's uh, the text. Um, my argument is that the stranger can't simply be, as it were, the Gestapo officers knocking on the door. Rather, it's a different sort of stranger. It's what Julia Kristeva, the Franco Bulgarian critic, talks about the stranger within, right? Which I guess is the point about unconscious desire. But before we talk about that, I think it's worth talking about what sort of genre this text fits in. Um, and particularly to consider it in the light of fairy tale, right? Can we talk about Judith Kerr's text as a fairy tale? Well, yes, in, in, in various ways, quite obviously, not least because we have a talking tiger, right? In fairy tales, we have talking animals. Um, uh, there's a talking tiger. Once there was a little girl called Sophie, it's very close to the fairy tale uh, 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 Once Upon a Time. And we also have a very interesting motif here um, of the threshold, okay? Um, here we have it. Here's the tiger standing on the threshold. Now, the threshold in folk culture is extremely important to cross the threshold, like lifting brides over thresholds and so on. It's a very important act. To invite the stranger over the threshold is to deliver yourself into his, because it normally is his power. Think of the, the, what are they called, the little goats and the wolf that's knocking on the door and so on. Um, and, you know, here we can think uh, uh, that the tiger is being invited in over the threshold. As a result, he feel, fulfills the figure in, in folktale of the trickster, right? The fox or the wolf who tricks, who deceives. Okay? And we can see, and if you, if you submit to the trickster, suddenly all sorts of unexpected chaotic things happen. Okay? So, so we have these, these elements that point towards um, 
uh, fairy tale. On the other hand, obviously, no, right? This is not um, a fairy tale by any means. Um, this is a, 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 an absolutely right, modern setting of the 1960s. The book came out in uh, 1968 uh, with refrigerators and cafes and so on. And we have, in terms of heroes, right, we have, um, we have a father, for example, who is very far right, from uh, some sort of knight in shining armor or whatever, some Prince Charming, here he is, careworn, his heavy briefcase that weighs him down and so on, here he is. Even though he's joyous, we can see he's probably got papers. We imagine him perhaps as a civil servant, but maybe the Red Sox, he might be more likely uh, working for the BBC, a creative, as it were, right, like Julius Kerr's husband, incidentally, at the time. Check suit, for example. But still, he's careworn. He's no, no Prince Charming. Um, so what have we got? We've got a text that points towards fairy tale, but points against it, um, that juxtaposes uh, elements of the extraordinary with elements of the realistic. The technical term, right, you know, it would be the fantastic. Svetan Todorov, another Franco-Bulgarian, coincidentally, used the, word, uh, the term fantastic to talk about literature that has this unsettling combination of totally unrealistic, extraordinary events and uh, 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 realistic settings. Um, here's Michael Rosen, perhaps in less, less sort of a high-flown language, talks about Judith Kerr creating a totally feasible, unfeasible experience, the juxtaposition of two realities in a way that would be impossible in our world. The result is both very funny and slightly unsettling. And the unsettling literature we might want to compare this to is Kafka, incidentally, right? For example, beginning of Metamorphosis by Kafka, uh, is uh, one day when Gregor Zamsa woke from uh, uneasy dreaming, he found himself changed into a, 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 a ungazifa, a beetle, right? Now, here, all of a sudden, in the middle of this, this text that is about sort of, you know, 19 teens, uh, 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 Austro-Hungarian Empire, somebody becomes a beetle, and it's not explained. And what is shocking in Kafka is less that Gregor Samsa wakes up and finds himself transformed into a beetle, but rather the fact that he's completely not, not shocked by it, right? And similarly, what's shocking here, so the unshockingness is shocking, what's shocking here is not, right, that the tiger turns up at the door, but actually that Sophie and her mummy say, yes, of course, come in, right? There's no shock to it gives us this strange sort of fantastic sense. Now, Kafka, Walter Benjamin, a German philosopher and critic who I wrote half my PhD on, he talked about Walter Benjamin as, as a writer of fairy tales for dialecticians. I think it's quite interesting, right? We might think of Kafka and Kerr and here having these fantastic, modern, uneasy, uncanny, to use another psychoanalytic word, uncanny fairy tales. Okay, so that's genre, but I will be talking about fairy tales quite a bit. Now, if we were to um, think of, I'm going to give you three readings, right? Three uh, uh, readings of, of, of the tale in terms of, or the story in terms of unconscious desire, and to a certain extent in terms of fairy tale. Um, and my argument is, once again, that they don't contradict each other. They overlay each other. We can, we can hold these readings, and we don't have to choose between them, right? That's a sort of basic interpretive approach particularly when you take a sort of psychoanalytic approach, that one reading doesn't contradict the other. But I am arguing that perhaps they are at, at, at levels of depth, right? That the first reading I'm going to give you is perhaps the most obvious surface reading, then comes the second, and finally comes the third, which is the deepest and arguably the darkest reading that I'm going to give you. So the first reading would be this. We could see the tiger uh, 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 who came to tea as really a simple morality tale, right? Um, uh, about what happens when you let strange men or strange male beings, in this case, tigers, into your house because you'll find that they have bestial desires, right? In this case, the, what the tiger who came to tea is close to is uh, Chasse per Perrault's version of Little Red Riding Hood, okay? You've got various sources for Little Red Riding Hood. Um, you've got the Brothers Grimm. That'll come to in a, 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 a bit later on. But you have Perrault. And Perrault is a French version, it's more courtly, it's more sanitized, it's more conventional. Whereas the Grimm's fairy tales are much more earthy and peasant-like and, and they're more interesting. But Perrault uh, 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 gives uh, his Little Red Riding Hood the following moral, and I quote here. Children, especially attractive, well-bred ladies, should never talk to strangers. 
For if they do so, they may well provide dinner for a wolf. I say wolf, but there are various kinds of wolves. There are also those who are charming, quiet, polite, unassuming, complacent, and sweet, who pursue young woman, women at home and in the streets. And unfortunately, it is these gentle wolves who are the most dangerous ones of all. Okay? So here we would have the, the tiger as some dangerous representation, essentially, of male desire, or male, we could, let's use the word, sexual appetite. Right? In which case, what's happening here is the desires the tiger's desire for, for food um, is his, you know, in one sense, is this idea of threatening masculinity. And what do the women do? They feed him. Feeding the tiger, then, is a way to channel, a safe way to channel this energy elsewhere. But, of course, we see this, this uh, appetite is insatiable. Right? Absolutely insatiable. He, he eats them out of house and home, even drinks all of daddy's uh, beer. But food is a sort of coping mechanism, right? a way to divert male appetites, a sort of substitute for sex. In which case, and I'll come back to this later on, the can of tiger food at the end right, is a suggestion that, yes, there will be a need for this in the future when Sophie grows up, but for the meantime being, this needs to be kept in a can. Right? This has to be, male sexual appetites need to be kept safely in, in well, not in a box, right, but in a tin. Um, so food is this sort of coping mechanism, according to this reading. The tiger would be male sexual desire. And the, the father, what is the father? He's a legitimate and sanctioned mode of masculinity. Right? He comes back and everything gets uh, set to right. And what does he suggest? Well, a much calmer, sanctioned form of appetite. Right? Look at this here. Um, here he is, and we have this sort of ordered, right? the father in the middle, the mother, the little girl, the ordered pleasure of the cafe that has been brought back uh, in co into control. Um, we also might think, looking here, if we look at this illustration here, of the figure on the left. Now, any avid readers of Judas Kerr, who does this guy on the left remind us of? The burglar from Mog, right? Wearing a flat cap and a check jacket. He's the sort of dubious character that actually the tiger is. The sort of person who needs to be kept away. We can see, by the way, how he's mirrored, right, with the father. So here the check top, here the check trousers. Here, here the leg going this way, the leg going that way. They were represented as mirrors but opposites. The father here in his sensible, ordered family grouping, and this guy who's now sloping off, right, who's disappearing. Um, the sort of dubious, wolfish figure that is the real-world equivalent of this glamorous tiger. Right? So this would be um, the reading of it, uh, one reading, the first reading, what I'm calling a patriarchal reading. Because in this case, the purpose of the book is to warn little girls that they have to stick with things as they are. It's a sort of conservative uh, 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 patriarchal uh, reading. The second reading um, is rather different, although it, it shares um, various uh, elements with the first. And this would be to see the tiger came to tea in terms of dreams. Right? And we can see that there's a sort of dreamlike quality to it. I, I describe, for example, that weird unshockingness of the tiger who appears at the door and Sophie and the mummy say, of course, come in, as being fantastic, but we could also call it a neeric, right? This sense that all these strange things happen in a dream, but that we take them for granted. We don't bat an eyelid, we just carry on exactly as normal. There's definitely a dreamlike or, or a neeric uh, quality here. Um, Particularly because, and as I say, I think the scene is, is quite important here. I will concentrate on some others a little bit more. Um, but the, what would you normally, how would you normally react if a tiger, you open the door and there's a tiger there? With fright, right? This is an event that is normally accompanied by one affect, by one emotion, if you want. But that affect here is, is missing. Now, Freud makes 
the basic point that this often happens in dreams. Here we have uh, Sigmund Freud from the interpretation of dreams. For in dreams, it is common for events to be accompanied by an entirely different affect from that that one would expect were those events to occur in waking life. Okay? Precisely what we've got here. The tiger is in your house, but you're not running around screaming. Quite interestingly, and totally coincidentally, about 30 pages on from this, no, maybe less, 20 pages on from that quotation in Sigmund Freud, he talks about a dream of three lions. That three lions, I think they're wandering around the Prater in Vienna, and nobody is scared at all, right, as an example of the way in which dreams have events without the affect you would have. It would be nice if there were tigers. It would make my thing rather easier, but it's, it's quite interesting. Freud's dream of lions, three lions. Um, but if we take this in terms of dreams, right? I don't know how good your psychoanalysis is or, or if you, you know, whatever, but what are dreams for Freud? They are wish fulfillments. They're expressions of the fulfillment of our desires. In which case, right, what would uh, the wish fulfillment be going on here and whose wish fulfillment is it? Well, my argument would be that it is the desires of the women, fundamentally. So instead of seeing uh, the tiger as sort of dangerous masculine sexual energy that intrudes on the domestic scene, here we can see the tiger as a sort of the fulfillment of which we actually want a tiger to come. Um, Bettelheim, and this is the important text, and it's really very old-fashioned, but it's really quite important. Um, he wrote, uh, Bruno Bettelheim wrote a great book called, I mean, much sort of in a way discredited in various ways, but still interesting, called The Uses of Enchantment, The Meaning and Importance of Fairy Tales, um, he does a, a, a thoroughgoing psychoanalysis of all the fairy tales, and they're still interesting, the insights that they have. Um, but he says, you know, makes a really very, very obvious point that in fairy tale, dangerous animals may you know, symbolize the untamed id, not yet subjected to ego and superego control in all its dangerous energy. But that, of course, is still desire. So here we have the tiger standing for, wished for, if we want, wild animal uh, encounters with men, right, we could say. They somehow represent something. And we could, for example, look at these series of male callers who it could possibly be, right? So Sophie's mummy said, I wonder who that can be. It can't be the milkman because he came this morning. Well, a milkman is this rather rotund middle-aged man. He's not exactly very dynamic or attractive. Can't be the boy from the grocer, because this isn't day terms. Well, he's a young boy, you know, this would be boring in another way. And it can't be daddy because he's got his key. Now, this is quite an interesting illustration. He's sort of rakish, his pose is slightly, right? And he's got one hand in his pocket, he's got a hint of a smile, but he's got a key. He's got that sense of domestic propriety. He's got his key. This is what's, you know... The tiger is normally kept under lock and key. Daddy has the key. There's something yeah, slightly ambivalent about it. And who does arrive? Well, it's the tiger. Exotic, glamorous, you know, matinee idol looks. Right? You know, the tiger is precisely sort of Clark Gable figure who you would want to come in uh, the door. And what happens then is a complete disruption right, of the patriarchy, complete disruption of uh, 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 the normal roles and so on. So first of all, we start in this very ordered maternal space, matriarchal space, if you want. I'll come back to that. But soon things begin to be, become a bit crazy. Um, uh, uh, what's more, if we go right at the end, um, you know, the house is a mess, the supper hasn't been made and so on we see women being allowed through the tiger to break out of the roles prescribed to them. Right? In fact, the internet commentators, some of them are great, and one of them makes this point, oh, in fact, the whole story is about how mummy's been on the gin all afternoon, the house is a mess, and she invents this thing about the tiger. Right? You know, I mean, but, but that's got something. It, it's the way in which the tiger allows domestic hierarchy to be thrown into the air, and what we get is this riotous, carnivalesque, and I mean that in the actual proper sense of the way in which carnival overturns hierarchies, overturning normal roles, normal relationships, right? And a celebration, not of sort of, you know, uh, sexuality or desire as within, you know, conjugal duties, but here as excess, as play, right? You can see this extraordinary stuff. I'm not saying it's sex, right? Don't get me wrong here. 
Um, but we get this, this, this joyful celebration of excess and the bodily function, right? Eating, drinking, play, making a mess, and so on. Um, and once again, you know, let's contrast, okay, the, the seriousness, um, where is he? The seriousness of daddy. Look here how when he comes back, how big he is in comparison to the women. Look how he sits in a chair as if on a throne, suddenly restoring the patriarchy, as if in judgment with this sort of troubled brow. And here they are, you know, what, what's she doing? She's complaining, she's explaining, but she's almost supplicating, right? And here he is in judgment. And here, you know, all the fun has gone. This is, it's almost like he's, he's saying grace, it occurs to me, you know, that he's, he thinks, oh, we must say, a few, say thanks to God before we, we have our sausages and chips and ice cream. Um, what this reading would uh, uh, suggest, which would be a sort of feminist reading, if you want, is this tiger who came to tea is a sort of subversive articulation of female desire that stand in opposition to the patriarchy. And what's more, an articulation of female solidarity. This is sort of mummy and Sophie's secret, right? You know, yes, they may explain to daddy what's going on, but he doesn't look like he believes anything. And afterwards, who goes and gets the tiger, the, 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 the tiger food? It's mummy and Sophie. This is for them, right? This is, they know about this stuff. And he, he either doesn't know about it or he doesn't believe it. It's a sort of secret between women, between mother and daughter. So this would be, right, the next level. So we've had a sort of patriarchal level. We've had a, perhaps a feminist level, if you want. And um, I realize, by the way, we're not going to be the whole of, here the whole of the full hour. I cut a lot of material <laughs> out of my... Um, but that's fine. Um, we'll have time for chat, and you can disagree with me. The final level, um, I'm, I'm going to suggest, is an electoral level. Okay? Because let's look at it again. Um... We talked about Perrault's uh, reading of, or reading version of Little Red Riding Hood. In fact, um, the version that um, the Tiger came to tea maps onto better is the Brothers Grimm. Okay, and this is the one that probably we're uh, more for work familiar with. And here's Bettelheim on, on Little Red Riding Hood, or what he calls Little Red Cat. It's rather, I can't remember, was it written in English or German? He emigrated to the States, but anyway. Um, probably in English, so it's his version. Um, little Red Cap, in symbolic form, projects the girl into the dangers of her Oedipal conflicts during puberty and then saves her from them so that she will be able to mature conflict-free. This is basically Bethel Times reading for a fairy tale full, full stop, is there are ways in which children learn to express but manage their underlying unconscious desires, okay? The maternal figures of mother and witch have shrunk, and hold the word shrunk for a moment, shrunk into in insignificance in Little Red Cap, where neither mother nor grandmother can do anything, neither threaten nor protect. The male, by contrast, is all-important, split into two opposite forms. The dangerous seducer, i.e. the wolf, right, who, if given into turns into the destroyer of the good grandmother and the girl, and the hunter, the responsible, strong, and rescuing father figure. So the argument is that the women are, are sidelined and threatened, right? and that the male figure, the father figure, as it were, is split into two. The wolf, on the one hand, this desirable but dangerous, rapacious character who mustn't be given into. And then the father as sort of wants sanction sexuality or sanction male power, the huntsman who puts everything to right, who, who, who kills uh, uh, the wolf in the uh, fairy tale. Now, what have we got here? Right? We have something really, really similar going on. Let's look at the way in which when the tiger comes in, the mother is sidelined. So here they are. And once again, let's come back to this idea of tea time as the site of matriarchy. Now, you know, I grew up in a sort of, you know, reasonably posh uh, uh, traditional household, and it was basically a patriarchal space, but tea time was a matriarchal one. Had in the kitchen or the nursery or whatever it might be, it was where, you know, think of the, the, the expression, who's going to be mother? 
right? Mother's power is absolutely expressed in that, as opposed to the patriarchal spaces um, that were elsewhere. And here we have this ritualistic expression of a certain form of maternal power over, over tea. And she's holding the teapot. She is mother, right? But what happens is, first of all, Sophie takes matters into her own hands. She breaks the rules. She stands up. She offers the food to this curious guest. And finally, right, the mother's hold on power on the teapot literally is, it, it, it is removed. Here he is, completely breaking all the rules of matriarchy. And now the mother's gone. Right? It's simply Sophie and the tiger. Okay, just the tiger now. Sophie and the tiger doing this strange sort of extremely sensual, one would argue, at the very least, sort of dance of two, right? Here she is stroking herself with the uh, tiger's uh, uh, tail, right? And then gradually, right, the debris begins um, to settle. This is, one could argue, the re a revolt of the daughter against the matriarchal hierarchy of tea time, through the tiger, Sophie can symbolically play at being mother, right? Dance with this male figure, um, excluding her real mother to dally amorously with this alluring and dangerous daddy figure, right? Um, now, you know, the idea that Little Red Riding Hood, perhaps the tiger who came to tea, um, uh, 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 less obviously, is based on this strange attraction, right? It's not, not a new one. Um, I want, I, the, the stuff doesn't work, but Gustave Doré's illustration of, of Little Red Riding Hood has this very famous uh, 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 illustration of Little Red Riding Hood in bed, right, with the wolf. Um, uh, and and, and Bettelheim says, um, the combination of feelings her face and body suggest can best be described as fascination. It's the same uh, uh, fascination with sex and everything surrounding it. Sorry, that which sex and everything surrounding it exercises over the child's uh, mind. Um, or, for example, I've got another quotation I didn't put out here. Um, Juna Barnes, the American writer, um, said uh, her quotation is, children know something they can't tell. They like Little Red Riding Hood and the wolf in bed. Right? You know, there's a, quite an established tradition of thinking about this, not simply in psycholytic terms in that way. And it's hard to look at pictures like this, right, without seeing at least the sort of, this is a sensual uh, 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 expression of some, some sensuality of some sort. Right? Um, and the father is likewise split into tiger on the one hand, we'd say, and huntsman. Um, Here's Bettelheim on the, again on the figure of the huntsman in fairy tales. The hunter of fairy tales is not a figure who kills friendly creatures, but one who dominates, controls, and subdues wild and ferocious beasts. Well, here, the tiger wanders off into the night. Okay? The tiger is not killed. The huntsman arrives too late, uh, one could um, possibly suggest. But at this picture... Right, what do we see? We see right bang in the middle, looking out at us, this tabby cat, right? The tiger has been domesticated. The, with the protective arms, right, paternal arms around them, right, well, these women can now walk away from this, this figure who has been domesticated, who's been transformed into something safe by the returning father uh, huntsman. And I think this is, so we had the three levels, we had patriarchal, we had feminist, and now we have uh, Oedipal or Electral, right? Electro complex is simply another word for little girl's version of the Oedipus complex. We have the, this Electral reading. And I talked about the three readings in terms of layers. This then would be the lowest layer, right? This is the sort of deepest, uncanniest part of the text, the, the, the stuff that is going on perhaps really without us thinking about it or noticing about it. But I think it's what makes the text this sort of intoxicating, unsettling, unusual mixture of repressed desires and fears that she is able in this very, you know, playful and charming and warm way, right, to bring out and allow, allow us in the safe, safe place that is stories, that is 
children's story um, allows to sort of uh, uh, us to enjoy without even knowing about it. Um, so, so much for my three readings. I now want to think, though, a little bit about the end, right? The end of the book. And then here is where, if we said at the beginning that this isn't a fairy tale, right? There is no happily, what is it? Happily lived ever after. Oh, they all lived happily ever after. Um, here we have something else going on. Be precisely because it's a fantastic tale, not a fairy tale, or it's a modern fairy tale or something, the end here is, is, is decidingly, decidedly odd and, 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 and gives uh, something else. So I've called it, if you forgive the pun, a twist in the tale. Right? That's uh, what's going on here. Now, Bettelheim argues that essentially fairy tale stories have an arc, right? that you, you know, the hero goes out into the world, all sorts of unsettling things happen, Little Red Riding Hood sets off on her path on her way to visit the grandmother, but at the end of the day, everything is set to right. right? So, so there's an arc. Desires are explored, but eventually they're put back into their proper order. As a result, for Bettelheim, um, fairy tale has this important function for children that allows them to come back to this place where everything has been restored. So here we have it, um, the quotation, the fairy tale from its mundane and simple beginning launches into fantastic events. But however big the detours, unlike the child's untutored mind or a dream, the process of the story does not get lost, having taken the child on a trip into a wondrous world. At its end, the tale returns the child to reality in a most reassuring manner. This teaches the child what he needs most to know at this stage of his development, that permitting one's fantasy to take hold of oneself for a while is not detrimental, provided one does not retain permanently caught up in it, remain permanently caught up in it. At the story's end, the hero returns to reality, a happy reality, but one devoid of magic. Devoid of magic. That's the important point. We can think of a number of, as it were, modern fairy tales or children's books or, or other things where there is a journey that, that, that happens right, into some magical realm and there's a return. Think of C.S. Lewis, for example, the Narnia stories where there's the wardrobe. You go through the wardrobe to go into Narnia, but you can come back if you don't lose your way right through the wardrobe again. But actually, something remains. The winter coats that are left in Narnia, for example. There's a sense that that portal isn't entirely closed. Another example would be, and I don't know if any of you are the right generation for this, Mr. Ben. Do you know Mr. Ben? Oh, well, it's absolutely brilliant. Fantastic uh, 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 animated series from the 70s, and where Mr. Ben is this very boring man who wears this sort of Magritian bowler hat and suit, and he lives in a suburban house, and, and, and he, sets, he decides every so often to go and visit the fancy dress shop. And he goes into the fancy dress shop, and, fancy, and, and if by magic the owner appears, and he says, what would you like to try on today? And Mr. Ben will, will try on, I don't know, a coat of armor or a diving suit or a cowboy outfit. And he'll go into the changing room, and he'll go out another door of the changing room, and he'll have, a, have an adventure in, you know, as a cowboy or in, under the water or in, in the medieval period or whatever it might be. And then he'll come back. And he'll change back into his suit and he'll go back to his house. But always there's something that remains. He'll find in the pocket of his suit a box of matches with a dragon on it when he's been to, I don't know, playing as a knight, uh, 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 fighting dragons and so on. This idea of the, the remnant, what's left over, this, this, the, the, the world that's left isn't entirely devoid of magic. I think this is an interesting idea. Now, what do we have here? We have the tiger food. Now, what is this tiger food? In a sense, it's one of the oddest things at all. I mean, look, at here it is, absurdly big. Where do you buy tiger food? Right? What is tiger food? What could this thing be? It's meant to pro provide safety in case the tiger comes back. Right? But what on earth could be that big that is both absurdly big for Sophie to, 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 to carry, but also... Absurdly small, right? What could possibly uh, uh, sat sate the, the tiger's appetite? 
it functions as a sort of prophylactic charm. It's going to prevent the tiger coming back. It, it, but it's also a threat. It's permanently there, this tiger food. That is, everything's gone back to normal, but we know that in the cupboard, right, uh, somewhere where, where daddies don't go, incidentally, the kitchen cupboard, this tiger food is there. It's a source of reassurance, um, but it's also a promise of future pleasure. Maybe the tiger will come back and we can feed him this. So it's, it's both about transgression, but it's also about con conservation, right? Exactly the opposite. It's an element of magic, but it's also very prosaic, a can, right? It's closed, but it's waiting to be opened. It's familiar and it's secret. It's a sort of uncanny can, right? Um, which, which perhaps do we want to open it? Do we not want to open it? Is it still there, right? What is it? It's a very, very... Uh, a, a curious object that remains from, has this strange m magical aura even within its prosaic confines. And the other very odd, well they're all odd, is the final illustration. Now what's going on here, right? We see um, the, well let's read the last bit, okay, so, and they also bought a very big tin of tiger food in case the tiger should come up to tea again but he never did. Now, what does this make us think of? Here he is with this serpentine goodbye. He never did, right? Now, where is he going? He looks like he's going out, right, of the picture, away from the viewer. Um, the association, he has this strange trumpet, right, but it's not quite a trumpet. Um, you know, one thing that it reminds me of, of course, is a snake charmer, right, something exotic, tiger from India. Here we have this S like a snake, so we're thinking of, of hypnotic right, ability to put someone into your power, and we've already seen the tiger could put everybody into his power. Uh, uh, there's also, by the way, a sort of post-colonial interpretation on the internet boards that I don't really agree with, but it's quite interesting thinking, yeah, that uh, he's, of course, uh, an Indian tiger. But yeah, the snake charmer type. The thing that, the other thing is, of course, is the Pied Piper of Hamelin, right? Now, the, the Pied Piper, der Rattenfänger von Hamelin, right, the rat catcher of Hamelin, in fact. Who catches rats but cats, okay? So it seems reasonably clear. The other thing is, we in uh, Britain tend to think of um, the Pied Piper with the diamond pattern of the Harlequin, right? Whereas, in fact, in a German and earlier tradition, and I even found that in the Stadtkirche of Hamelin, there is a stained glass representation of him. I haven't got that for you here. He would have had striped clothing, right? With the Pied Piper would have been striped, not harlequined, not with the diamonds. And there's a really interesting book, incidentally, I don't know if it's been translated by a, a fr wonderful French guy called Michel Pasteurot, who has written a whole book about striped clothing. Who wears striped clothing? You wear striped clothing. Yes, I've probably got, I often wear striped clothing. Um, uh, striped clothing is a sign of transgression. Okay? It's the stripes that break up the plain thing. So he does this stuff about prostitutes in the Middle Ages, Picasso and artists of, you know, the turn sec, wearing Breton tops, uh, convicts wearing striped clothing, right? This idea that st a whole book about stripes and striped clothing. I mean, it's only about 120 page long. Um, but he calls it the, the l'étoffe du diable, the, 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 the cloth of the devil by Michel Pastoreau, right? Striped clothing. And the Pied Piper of Hamelin also traditionally would have had, would have had been dressed in stripes. And what does the Pied Piper of the Hamelin do? He lures children away with this music that adults don't respond to, but children do. And there's a sense that, I would argue in this final illustration, the tiger may not come back, but he's, he's uh, 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 luring us away. He's luring the children back into this world of fantasy and play and so on, but, um, from which adults have been sidelined. Um, so if for Bettelheim the key functions of fairy tale are of resolution, uh, of uh, the reconciliation of unconscious conflicts and of the integration of the child um, back into the world of the everyday. Um, Kerr's text here, particularly, by the way, notice how the way in which the, 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 the 
and the images are totally at odds with each other, right? I mean, I would argue that this, and he never did, is totally incompatible with this, with, with this representation, but does promise more, that perhaps is a promise of return. Um, Curse text doesn't offer, offer any simple happy, uh, they all live happily ever after, um, rather the repressed is bound to return. I mean, that's a fundamental insight of, 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 of uh, a psychoanalysis, that whatever is repressed, repressed desire, will return at some point, you know, perhaps when we're old enough for it to be right. You know. um, and as a result, you know, it's not that he never did, but I think, you know, the, the unsettlingly, attractively, threateningly, um, Kerr's text suggests that the tiger will come to tea again. So there we go. Thank you. Um, okay. That's, that's my lot. What do we think? Yeah.